Dave Cast here on the 21st day of May. Uh, it started off a little rainy, but I think the sun's coming out. It's going to be a great day. So great. Uh, back on Tuesday, we started a new study in the book of Exodus, uh, second book of the Bible. And today we're going to continue with that. Um, the setting for Exodus, at least in the beginning, is Egypt. Uh, and so it's now been a, a number of years, probably actually generations, uh, since Jacob, uh, Jacob's sons and their descendants had, uh, had all moved to, to Egypt. And, and, and remember that they had moved to escape there originally uh, as a famine, a real bad famine that was in their homeland, ancestry land, which was called Canaan. Uh, but now a new king, uh, or Pharaoh, which is an Egyptian king, had come to power, and he had no regard whatsoever for their brother Joseph, uh, and that all that he had done uh, for the Egyptian people to keep them whole uh, during their famine. And so uh, he had led a movement to make them into slaves. And, and it tells us in Exodus uh, one fourteen, uh, they made their lives bitter with harsh labor, uh, in brick and mortar, uh, and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. And so before we get into the story today, uh, I wanted to say something in background, because I don't know about you, but when I was a young kid, like back in Sunday school, I used to get confused because sometimes the Jews were called Hebrews, and sometimes they were called Israelites, and sometimes they were called the children of Israel, uh, and sometimes they were called Semites, although I'm not really sure that word is actually in the Hebrew Bible. But, but anyway, there were different ways of referring to the same people. And, and so why? Well, we'll start with the word Hebrew. And the first time that we see that word is in Genesis uh, 14, 13. And it says, uh, then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite. And so Abram, later he'd be called Abraham, Abram the Hebrew. And what that word literally means is one who lives on the other side of the river. And it could mean immigrant or something like other, but, but that's the origin. And so then, starting with Abraham, we hear uh, this chosen people of God called Hebrews. And so then, how about Israel or Israelites? And that has to do with a story that happens in chapter 32 of Genesis. And that's where Jacob wrestled with an angel and he, he was asking for a blessing from God. And the scripture says that from that time on, he will be called Israel, meaning one who wrestles with God. And so uh, they're called Israelites or children of Israel. Uh, and so the reason why is pretty obvious to me. And, and then Jews comes from um, Judah, fourth son of, of, of Jacob. And Semites goes back to the descendants of Shem, uh, who was one of Noah's sons. And so Hebrews, uh, the Hebrew children, Israelites, children of Israel, Jews, Jewish people, you'll hear those terms being used interchangeably. Uh, and so if that was confusing to you, it used to be confusing to me too. And so, uh, okay, let's get into the story. And today we're picking up in chapter 2. Uh, Moses is now uh, grown up, and, and although he's been adopted in infancy by the Pharaoh's daughter, Moses is aware of his identity because, as you remember, the first three years of his life, Moses had been actually nursed by his, his mother, so he, he knew them. Uh, and so chapter 211 says that one day uh, after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He sees his people. Very interesting turn in the story. He saw now, some version says he watched their forced labor. But notice, he doesn't merely observe them in passing or, or casually stop and see how they're doing. He sees his people, sees the way they are oppressed, and his heart goes out to them because these are his own people. And as he's standing there watching them, he sees one of the Egyptians beating a Hebrew slave. And he's filled with compassion and rage, and he just loses it. 
and he, and he looks around this way and that, and then he goes and he gets in this confrontation. He ends up killing the Egyptian. And then the very next day, Moses goes out again, and he watches his people laboring. But this time, he sees two of the Hebrews fighting with each other. And so he steps in to break it up, and he says, Hey, hey, stop it, stop it. Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And Now, I don't know if this man knew Moses' background or not, but it's clear the man did not view Moses as a, a fellow Hebrew, uh, but he viewed him as one of the privileged above them. Because he says, huh, who made you ruler and judge over us? What are you going to do? Kill me like you killed that guy yesterday? And so these guys, they're not looking at Moses as an agent of justice and the deliverer of his people. But they're looking at him as some hot-headed person with a violent temper who is now meddling in their business. So Moses realized it's out there. The rumor mill is going around, and, and people know about him killing this Egyptian. And so when Pharaoh hears about it, he wants him dead. And I don't know, it's not in the scripture, but you can see this whole Moses thing maybe had been a bone of contention with he and his daughter all these years, and that he's never really liked this Hebrew kid that's grown up in the palace. Because Pharaoh clearly has no regard for the Jews. He's prejudiced against them. He's oppressed them. He's made them into slaves. And so he wants Moses dead, and Moses has to flee, and he gets out of there, and he goes a long way away to a place called Midian. And so one day he is there in Midian sitting by a well, and seven young women come to draw uh, water out of the well for their father's flocks. And... Uh, there's these shepherds that are there, and they come up, and they start hassling these women and trying to keep them away from the well, uh, you know, so their sh sh sheep can't get any water. And, and once again, once again, we see Moses' compassion and his anger. And so he ends up getting up and yelling at the shepherd, and he runs them all off, and then he, he helps these women, and he help, gets their water for their, for their sheep and their flocks. And, uh, and these young women then, they, they go home and they tell their father, uh, whose name the scripture says, at least at this point in the scripture, is rule. And so if you thought like, like Hebrews, Israelites, Jews, that all these different terms for the same people, that that was confusing, this guy rule is going to be great for you. Because he's also called Jethro. That comes up in the next chapter. And then sometimes he's called Jether. And just to make things even more confusing, the same guy is also called Hob Hobab at, at different parts of the scripture. So, so anyway, Rule was probably his family name, and Jethro was likely his first name. And so uh, he hears of Moses' courage and his generosity, uh, generosity, and he invites him to come to his home. He ends up giving him a job and, and actually offers his daughter Zipporah to him. And let me say this, if you know of anyone who might be having a baby right now, and so they're, they're looking for biblical names for their kids, you know, if it's a little girl, might I suggest Zipporah? What a, it's a beautiful name. So Moses marries Zipporah, and then time passes, and Moses lives in Midian for a long time, 40 years. But during that time, you know, it's kind of clear he never felt like Midian was his real home. Because he has a son, and he names him Gershon, which means, Gershon means, I become a foreigner in a foreign land. And so, a long time. And it's not just that I'm inferring that it was a long time. The text uses that language. That's the language they use. Uh, I'll read it to you in verse 23. It says, during that long period, the king of Egypt died, which is significant, uh, and the Israelites were still enslaved slavery and they groaned and they cried out in their help uh, for help because of their slavery and that went up to God and God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob and so God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them and so we're going to stop there in the story for today and I want to do just a little reflecting a long time 
40 years. That was a long time for Moses. That was a long time for the Israelites. 40 years. I mean, can you imagine? Because that makes me think about our present situation. It's been a long time. It's been a couple of months now sheltering in place. And I know we're reopening parts of our society, and, and we need to, but it's not over, and, and we know that. It's, a, it's just been a long time, and if you're like me, I'm just completely over this coronavirus lockdown. I'm tired of Zoom meetings. I'm tired of depending on technology and the internet for everything. I'm tired of Netflix and Hulu. I miss my friends. I, I want to go back to church and, and hug everybody's neck. I want to see people's faces, and I don't want to see people's faces with masks on either. And, and some days it all just seems like wasted time, waiting. I'm so tired of waiting. But the more I study the Bible, the more I am aware there is a lot of waiting going on with God's people. Abraham and Sarah waited for a son. And, and actually, Rachel and Hannah had to, to wait, by the way, as well. Joseph in prison, he waited for a promotion, right? Moses waited to lead the Israelites out of slavery. Joshua, Joshua waited for the promised land. Ruth waited for a husband. David waited to become a, a king. Uh, Elijah waited for rain. Job waited uh, for his suffering to come to an end. Paul waited for release from prison. It, it just goes on and on. It's waiting. But it was in those times of waiting that these people were called to serve their families and those around them. It was during that long time that they were called to learn about and to listen expectantly to God. And they're waiting. They learn to pray. They learn to not grumble or complain. And just to fulfill the ordinary work that God had called them to. I mean, it wasn't glamorous. It wasn't showy. It wasn't especially exciting. But, and, and don't miss this, it was preparing them for what lay ahead. Don Henley wrote a song uh, that's on the Eagles Hotel California called Wasted Time. Uh, and to be honest, uh, the song is really about relationships that have gone bad and not, you know, waiting around sheltering in place during a pandemic. But my point is this. The song ends with these words. So you can get on with your search, baby, and I can get on with mine. And maybe one day we will find that it wasn't really wasted time. During those years in Midian, out in the fields, tending the herds for his father-in-law, Jethro, God was preparing Moses for 40 years. It, it wasn't wasted time. God was at work preparing Moses to be the one who would lead the children of Israel out of slavery into the promised land. And, which, by the way, that story, you know, that was a long time, too. It was 40 years wandering in the, you know, but we'll get to that soon enough. But as far as you and me, here and now, God is at work as well. And my prayer for all of us is that we will find one day that it really wasn't wasted time. Because it's not. God is at work. God is at work. I believe that. So remember that as we come to the close today. We will... Continue with Saturday with the call of Moses. And uh, I want to leave you with these words, these wise words of John Wesley. Though I'm always in haste, I'm never in a hurry. Because my friends, in these days of waiting, may you make the most of the time. As God is shaping you for the call that is coming that will lead you out of the wilderness. So keep bringing the hope I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.